In the first lecture, we took a broad overview of the assumptions that will underlie this course, the goals that we'll pursue for improving writing, and some of the terms that we'll employ as we try to understand how sentences work and how we can make them work better. In this lecture, we'll look a bit more closely at key terms we'll be using, not because those terms are important in their own right, but because they give us better tools for describing sentences and for helping us understand and control the choices we make when we write. I've always been fond of a distinction drawn by John Steinbeck in his introduction to The Log from the Sea of Cortez, a little book describing a marine specimen collecting trip that Steinbeck and his friend Ed Ricketts made in 1940. There, Steinbeck considers what it means to go on an expedition and how each expedition inevitably shapes the reality it hopes to study. More specifically, he notes that one of the processes at the heart of studying marine biology, naming the parts of a fish and cataloging a fish in terms of its structure, doesn't actually tell the full story. As he explains, a fish can be rigorously identified by counting its spines, quote, for example, the Mexican Sierra has Roman numeral 17 dash Arabic numeral 15 dash Roman numeral 9 spines in the dorsal fin. These can be easily counted, but if the Sierra strikes hard on the line so that our hands are burned, if the fish sounds and nearly escapes and finally comes in over the rail, his colors pulsing and his tail beating the air, a whole new relational externality has come into being, an entity which is more than the sum of the fish plus the fisherman. The only way to count the spines of the Sierra unaffected by this second relational reality is to sit in a laboratory, open an evil smelling jar, remove a stiff colorless fish from formalin solution, count the spines and write the truth. D, Roman numeral 17, Arabic numeral 15, Roman numeral 9. There, you have recorded a reality which cannot be assailed, probably the least important reality concerning either the fish or yourself. Sure, Steinbeck is slanting the case to stress the subjective relational reality we might have with a living fish over the quite technical objective way we might need to categorize or specifically identify the fish. But I love his reminder about the great differences that exist between the way we encounter and experience a live fish in nature and the way we might encounter or experience a quite dead fish in the laboratory. And his point seems to me to also apply equally to sentences, and not just because they can also be slippery. Most of the terms we use to identify sentences or to label their parts Treat the sentence as something dead, to be dissected, its parts identified. This ignores the fact that what Steinbeck terms a relational reality exists between sentences and readers just as surely and much more frequently, with much more usually at stake, than exists between a fisherman and a fish. Sentences are alive. We experience them in time, and we react to their unfolding as they twist and turn, challenging us, teasing us, surprising us, sometimes boring or confusing us as we read them. Accordingly, whenever possible, I will use terms in this course that focus on the sentence as a thing in motion, an experience, something with which we form a relational reality when we read, rather than as something stiff and lifeless whose parts can be counted or named. As I'll try to explain more fully in a moment, I see this distinction as primarily between viewing the sentence as a grammatical phenomenon or as a rhetorical phenomenon. But before I get to the distinctions I see between grammatical and rhetorical concerns, I want to look at the phrase elegant and effective writing. Now both of those modifiers have everything to do with what Steinbeck was talking about when he described the relational reality someone might have with a living fish and not much at all to do 
with labeling and categorizing with objective rigor. What one reader or writer may find elegant is not the same as what another reader or writer may find elegant. And while we may be able to measure effectiveness a bit more objectively than we can measure elegance, determining how effective writing is also remains largely a matter of personal taste. So let me tell you what I mean by these two important terms. First, effective. For me, effective writing is writing that anticipates, shapes, and satisfies a reader's need for information. Effective writing gives the reader the information necessary for thoughtful consideration of the writer's purpose in introducing a subject. It anticipates the obvious questions an interested reader may form, and it accomplishes both the informational and emotional goals of the writer. Effective writing guides the reader's thinking, satisfies the reader's need for essential information, and implicitly assures the reader that he or she is in good hands, reading prose by a writer who anticipates both the reader's informational and the reader's emotional needs. Accordingly, one of the assumptions shaping my approach to teaching writing is that unless the situation demands otherwise, sentences that convey more information are more effective than those that convey less. Sentences that anticipate and answer more questions that a reader might have are better than those that answer fewer questions. Sentences that bring ideas and images into clearer focus by adding more useful details and explanation are generally more effective than those that are less clearly focused and that offer fewer details. In practice, this means that I generally value longer sentences over shorter sentences, as long as the length accomplishes some of those important goals I've just mentioned. Many of us have been exposed over the years to the idea that effective writing is simple and direct, a term generally associated with Strunk and White's legendary guidebook, The Elements of Style. Or we remember some of the slogans from that book, such as, omit needless words. Unfortunately, it's a lot harder for us to remember that Strunk con concluded his discussion of the mandate to omit needless words with this all-important qualifier, quote, this requires not that the writer make all sentences short or that he avoid all detail and treat subjects only in outline, but that every word tell, end of quote. Indeed, Strunk's concern is specifically with words and phrases that do not add propositions to the sentence. Phrases like, the reason why is that, used in place of because, or owing to the fact that, in place of since. It's far easier to remember the term simple and direct as a summary of Jacques Barzun's advice in his simple and direct a rhetoric for writers than it is to remember that simple does not mean simplistic, direct does not mean short, and simple and direct does not mean that we should all write like Ernest Hemingway in a hurry. Omit needless words is great advice, but not when it gets reduced to the belief that shorter is always better or that needless means any word without which the sentence can still make sense. And for those of us hypnotized and maddened by a recent TV advertisement for a headache remedy that just repeats its claim three times, apply directly to the forehead, apply directly to the forehead, apply directly to the forehead, we should remember that this odd and grating rhetorical strategy comes directly from the lecture practice of Professor Will Strunk circa 1919, as E.B. White reminds us in his introduction to Strunk's Rules for Plain English. So while I don't intend any advice I give about writing sentences to contradict the generally quite useful advice we can find in Strunk and White, I do want to suggest that it presents a very subjective aesthetic, as well as rules, for better writing. 
I like Faulkner as well as I like Hemingway. And I'd like to believe that even Professor Will Strunk and certainly E.B. White would not have tried to edit Faulkner out of existence. When Hemingway writes of an old waiter in a clean, well-lighted place, quote, he disliked bars and bodegas, few of us would argue that his sentence is not simple and direct and not free of needless words. But when Faulkner writes about the boy who's the protagonist in Barn Burning, it's hard to see how Strunk and White might apply. Quote, the boy, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. From where he sat, he could see the ranked shelves close packed with the solid, squat, dynamic shapes of tin cans, whose labels his stomach read, not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind, but from the scarlet devils and the silver curve of fish, this, the cheese which he knew he smelled, and the hermetic meat which his intestines believed he smelled, coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief between the other constant one, the smell and sense, just a little of fear, because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pull of the blood. I'm not so sure about what may or may not be needless in this particular sentence, but simple and direct, it most certainly is not. Now, both writers, Faulkner and Hemingway, introduce us to the thinking of their characters, but just as the thinking of Hemingway's old waiter is infinitely more tired and less active than the thinking of Faulkner's boy, the sentence each writer constructs is intended to hit us in very different ways for very different reasons start cutting out words and simplifying the syntax in Faulkner's sentence, and will miss the complex thinking that haunts the boy throughout the story and leads him ultimately to betray his father to keep him from burning another barn. But even Hemingway, the poster boy for simple and direct, reminds us that a simple and direct sentence is not the same as one that is simplistic and short as we can see from another sentence, an earlier sentence, from a clean, well-lighted place. Quote, In the daytime the street was dusty, but at night the dew settled the dust, and the old man liked to sit late because he was deaf, and now at night it was quiet, and he felt the difference. End of quote. Or to put this another way, Strunk and White do a great job of reminding us to avoid needless words. But they don't begin to consider all of the ways in which more words might actually be needed. My goal will be to explain why in many cases we need to add words to improve our writing, as Faulkner so frequently does, rather than trying to pare our writing down to some kind of telegraphic minimum, as is frequently the case with Hemingway. And while I'm mentioning Strunk and White, let me suggest that we could all do a lot worse than digging out that tattered copy we've had since high school or college and giving it a fresh read. Then, let me suggest you acquire and put on your bookshelf right next to Strunk and White's The Elements of Style, Bill Walsh's The Elephants of Style, subtitled A Trunkload of Tips on the Big Issues and Gray Areas of Contemporary American English. Walsh, a writer for the Washington Post, offers a number of useful tips about writing, most of which are a whole lot funnier than the tips served up by Will Strunk and E.B. White. Now, elegant. Effective writing is largely by, determined by how well the writer's efforts respond to the situation that occasioned the writing, the writer's purpose in writing, and the reader's needs. Most of us can agree whether writing is effective or not, although we may disagree widely about whether one kind of effective writing is preferable to another. Elegant writing is much harder for us to agree upon. And indeed, the implication of Strunk and White and of a number of other guidebooks about writing might be that elegant writing is gaudy writing, overly lush, opulent, and mannered, and therefore should be avoided. Indeed, in his celebrated modern English usage, H.W. Fowler specifically warned against elegant variation in prose style, what he characterized as the tendency of second-rate writers 
to concentrate more on expressing themselves prettily than on conveying their meaning clearly. Now, I don't want to argue with Fowler any more than I want to argue with Strunk and White, so I need to state that I'm referring to elegant prose style in the same way mathematicians refer to the elegant solution to a math problem. In fact, elegant solutions in math are the most direct routes to solving a problem, taking the fewest number of steps, offering the solution which is seen as the simplest, neatest, or cleanest response to a problem, no matter how complex the problem is. It's crucial that we understand, however, that writing problems are very different from mathematical problems. As Jacques Barzun reminds us, quote, language is not an algebra, and there is no single right answer to any given predicament with words, end of quote. In writing, elegance is indeed a matter of efficiency, but we need to remember that the problems a writer attempts to solve have an emotional or affective dimension not generally associated with mathematics. Accordingly, elegant sentences are those that efficiently accomplish what the writer wants them to accomplish. And while there may be only one elegant solution to a math problem, there may be many different elegant solutions to a problem we address with language. All of which is simply to say that there may not be that much difference between writing we find effective and writing we find elegant. And the two terms, much as is the case with form and content, may actually be inextricably wrapped up with each other. Indeed, we might think of elegant writing as writing that is unusually effective. Both terms, however, are subjectively relational, having to do with the impact writing has on a reader, with the way the reader experiences writing, rather than objectively describable or prescribable. When we refer to sentences as effective or as elegant, we refer to what they do rather than to the parts they consist of. And no amount of sophisticated vocabulary or complicated syntax can make a sentence effective or elegant unless that sentence accomplishes the task it was intended to accomplish. Both Hemingway and Faulkner strike me as elegant writers, because they're so good at accomplishing what they set out to do. It's hard to imagine the writer who could out Hemingway Hemingway, or who could out Faulkner Faulkner, and attempts to do so generally seem humorous, as each found the elegant solution to the problems he wanted to write about. A reminder of this can be found in the best of bad Faulkner, choice entries from the faux Faulkner contest a collection of Faulkner parodies, including one by John Rumler entitled Brand Burning. In it, we find a sentence that is vaguely familiar. Quote, he could see through the square of the glass into the oven, and though he could not read the recipe on the counter, the black lettering meant nothing to him like history. He knew he smelled in the steady wash of warm air and unwashed family, another smell, a scent of fear and decay and grief, for he was a full-blooded Snopes, blind to the truth and chained to the past, whether he knew it or not, and the rush of blood to his head made him woozy like his brothers Heck and I.O.U., who were anxious to confess their guilt and leave the kitchen where no good ever originated, not the way their mother cooked, and to run to town for Coca-Colas and ding-dongs and some conversation at Homer Barron's 7-Eleven, which was only open 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. when Homer went home for supper, but their father would not let up, not for one minute, for he fancied himself wise as Solomon, who never put to death an honest man, for who among us is honest or ever was, except him who died on the cross. Whew. Effective? Yes, as a parody. Elegant? Not so much. The final two terms I want to discuss in this lecture, grammatical and rhetorical, are both easier to define than are effective and elegant, and they're both more important. If we remember Steinbeck's discussion of different ways of looking at and thinking about the Mexican Sierra, 
We might say that grammatical descriptions of the sentence are primarily concerned with identifying its parts, while rhetorical descriptions of the sentence are primarily concerned with identifying that relational reality established when a reader reads or hears the sentence. Grammar has to do with relationships among words largely irrespective of their meaning. Grammar has to do with classifying words by their function in a sentence, by what part of speech a word may be, how we refer to its tense if it's a verb, whether a noun is singular or plural and agrees with the verb. The doctor is a woman, the swimmers are men. So grammar deals with the rules underlying our understanding and use of language. Most of these rules we've unconsciously known ever since we learned to speak. Some of these rules are not rules at all, but simply reflect majority values or practices and can be broken without any real harm to making ourselves understood, as in a phrase frequently attributed to Winston Churchill. The story goes that Churchill slyly reminded us how silly it is to make a rule that we have to obey that precludes ending a sentence with a preposition, as Churchill put it, by referring to the things up with which he would not put. Now, the Harbrace College Handbook I was required to purchase as a college freshman contains a glossary of grammatical terms that runs on for some 24 pages. Included are terms such as parts of speech, nouns, pronouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, prepositions, participles, conjunctions, gerunds, and so on. Also included are grammatical terms that refer to groups of words, such as clauses, phrases, subordinate clauses, predicates, and so on. Most of us will recognize, and we regularly use, most of these grammatical phenomena every day, although only a few of us can remember or keep in mind all of the specifics of each definition or all of the rules governing the correct use of each of them. Nor do we really need to. The dirty little secret of correct grammar is that it allows a writer to avoid grammatical mistakes, but the most perfect adherence to all the rules of grammar will not necessarily produce writing that is either effective or elegant. Grammar describes the machinery of the sentence, but it doesn't teach us how to make the sentence go anywhere or do anything. In other words, grammar is more than a little bit like counting the spines of a dead fish. Now, I'll use some grammatical terms as this course proceeds, simply because that's the easiest way for me to suggest how to get our sentences to do some of the things we want them to do. But knowing grammar backwards and forwards is not in itself a step toward better writing. In fact, it can and frequently does lead to boring or ineffective writing that is grammatically correct, but not good for much of anything else. My interest has to do much, much more with rhetoric. Through a history that no doubt dates from our earliest use of language, but that has been recorded from the 5th century BC, rhetoric has been associated with persuasion. For my purposes, rhetoric, unlike grammar, has to do with both motive and impact, the reasons why we use language to accomplish certain goals and the extent to which it accomplishes them. Or to put this another way, Grammar has to do with words, while rhetoric has to do with the way we do things with words. Rhetoric focuses on the producer of language, in our case, the speaker or writer, and on the receiver of language, the listener or reader. Grammar has to do with words as objects, which can be labeled and classified, while rhetoric has to do with the purposes to which we put language and to the consequences of our efforts. Richard Lanham, maverick rhetorician and author of Style and Anti-Textbook, to, to, a book to which we'll return later in the course, Lanham is trying to get at this crucial aspect of rhetoric when he rehearses the many different understandings of the term rhetoric over its 2,500-year history, only to conclude 
that a contemporary understanding of rhetoric best describes it as the, quote, science of a human attention structures. Rhetoric is about the best ways of getting and holding attention with language and shaping that attention to achieve particular outcomes. Whenever possible, the terms I use in this course will refer to rhetorical phenomena, things having to do with the way sentences work rather than with grammatical phenomena, what we label the parts of a sentence and how we understand the relationships among those parts. We've generated a lot of labels that are grammatical, such as categorizing sentences by the number and kinds of clauses they contain, leading us to describe sentences as simple, compound, or complex. But a simple sentence can create an incredibly complex reaction in a reader, and a complex sentence may have only a very simple impact. Accordingly, we will rely more on terms or labels that direct our attention to the ways in which sentences deliver their goods, remembering that what they deliver is emotional impact as well as information. And to be honest, some of the terms I'll use to describe the way sentences work, for example, referring to suspensive, intensive, or interruptive sentences, are terms I made up simply because I couldn't find existing terms that directed our attention to the rhetorical phenomena I wanted to discuss. The main point to remember here is that effectiveness and elegance in writing are both rhetorical issues, and grammar alone can lead us to neither. Oh yes, there's one other term I really ought to mention, although having gone this far without discussing it, I'm tempted to see if I can get away with not discussing it at all. That term is, of course, style. Style is a concept so rich, so expansive, so subjective, and so contested that any attempt to define it immediately encounters resistance, if not outright hostility. We refer to the style of a period, the style of a literary form or genre, the style of a nation, the style of an individual writer, the style of a work by an individual writer, the style of a particular period in a writer's career, as in early or late Henry James, the style of a group or movement of writers, the style of a particular period in a movement, as in early or late modernism, the style of a particular kind of sentence, and so on. Obviously, style means something different in each of these cases, not to mention that it can refer to features consciously chosen by the writer or consciously sought for and found by the reader. Just one word used to describe or focus our attention on so many different aspects of writing. So, with a mixture of desperation and ingenuity, I've come up with the definition of style that I use when talking about sentences. Style is what the writer writes and or what the reader reads. That's about as inclusive a definition of style as one can get. It's also a definition that refuses to distinguish style from content or meaning. I made the case earlier for the notion that style is content, but while we've been referring to Strunk and White, let me add E.B. White's considerable authority to this argument. In his brief essay, An Approach to Style, which he appended to Will Strunk's Rules, White admits that there is no satisfactory explanation of style, but does make clear his belief, quote, young writers often suppose that style is a garnish for the meat of prose, a sauce by which a dull dish is made palatable. Style has no such separate entity. It is non-detachable, unfilterable, end of quote. As our course progresses, I'll try to show why I so strongly agree with White and why I believe this assumption is central to any serious attempt to improve our writing.